broad stripes and bright stars from a perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming Ladies and gentlemen, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Incorporated, is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, Shaka Fatah representing the second district of Pennsylvania. Representative Fatah is a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee. He is also the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies. He has represented the citizens of Pennsylvania's second district since 1994. The recipient of 10 honorary doctorates, he was listed by Time Magazine as one of the 50 most promising leaders in America. Fatah is also chair of the Congressional Urban Caucus, a bipartisan group of members representing America's metropolitan centers. These members collaborate with other stakeholders to address the unique challenges facing America's urban communities. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Representative Shaka Fatah. Well, good morning. Let me welcome each and every one of you and please have a seat to the 44th Annual Legislative Conference. And on behalf of the staff, the board of directors of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, our interns, our volunteers, welcome to this year's National Town Hall meeting. Now, the foundation's work could not be possible without the support of our sponsors, and supporters. We want to thank each and every one who have helped us as we have went about the work of the foundation in producing the next generation of leaders, supporting interns and fellows, working on the Hill, gaining experience, also providing scholarships to young people to pursue a higher education and prepare themselves for work, both in the governmental sector, but also in other sectors in our society. I would be remiss if I did not recognize our Democratic leader who has joined us, and you'll hear from her at a point in our program, but please give a welcome to the Speaker of the House, the now Democratic leader and future Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Let me say that we have put together an extraordinary panel, and you're going to be engaged in a discussion that really will be the shaping impulse of the work of the foundation going forward. I want to thank you for your attendance here. I want to thank the hard work of the staff, particularly our president, Sharnice Washington, and the great work that's been done by the foundation. And then I want to introduce to you a brilliant, dynamic, 
Congresswoman from the great state of Ohio, who is the leader of the Congressional Black Caucus. She is fierce. She's independent. She has done an extraordinary job at a historic time in our nation. Welcome, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. Good morning again. Mary McLeod Bethune said, if we have the courage and the tenacity of our forebears who stood firmly like a rock against the lash of slavery, we shall find a way to do for our day what they did for theirs. Even in her day, she clearly understood what it took to move a nation of people forward. And she understood that we control our own destiny by being bold and proactive. Let me start by saying thank you to my colleague, Congressman Fatah, for his leadership as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and the CBC co-chairs, Joyce Beatty and Sanford Bishop, for setting the stage for this morning. Our theme for this gathering could not be more timely. Voting for change and, e and equal opportunity, midterm elections and the state of black America. It says to us that when election time rolls around this November, we'll be voting not only for politicians, but also for policies that will determine our way of life for years to come. If we are to realize the changes we want to see in our leadership in education and quality of life issues, we must vote on November 4th. This morning, we will discuss many issues that will impact our ability to participate in the electoral process. I know you will take this information home and put it to good use, and I thank you for that. Again, I welcome you and invite you to take advantage of all of the important information that you will receive over the next few days. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome A. Shawnice Washington, President and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Incorporated. For more than 15 years, she has played a variety of important roles in the organization, serving on the foundation's board of directors and corporate advisory council and as a corporate funder. Ms. Washington was the board's chair from March 2012 to February 2013 and is vice chair from 2010 to 2012. Her most recent corporate position was as Vice President, Government Affairs Policy and Outreach for Altria Corporate Services. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, Ms. A. Shawnice Washington. Well, thank you, Chairman Fatah and Chairwoman Fudge not only for your presence here today, but also for the work you do every single day to improve the quality of lives in our community. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend this morning with us. We appreciate your presence, and we want you to know that we do not take it for granted. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our 44th Annual Legislative Conference, and I would like to join Chairman Fatah in thanking the CBCF Board of Directors, staff, fellows, volunteers, and interns who work very hard each year to make this conference a success. You know, education is one of the core pillars through which CBCF delivers against its mission, and we have joined the nation in emphasizing science, technology, engineering, and math education within the African American community. Once again, we are proud to introduce our fellows who are already on their way to changing the world. The 2014 CBCF fellows are Oki Inya, a Lewis Stokes Urban Health Public Policy Fellow. Oki is a native of Chicago, Illinois, he holds a master's degree in public health from Chicago State University, where he served as the vice president of the MPH Student Association. <laughs> Rashad Favors, Congressional Fellow, Focus, Courts, and Criminal Justice. 
Rashad Favors is from Jacksonville, Florida, and holds a Juris Doctorate from Florida A&M College of Law and a bachelor's degree in marketing from the University of Central Florida. <laughs> Venika Gray, Congressional Fellow, Focus Education. Venetia is a graduate of Southern University Agricultural and Mechanical College, where she received a master's degree in public administration with an emphasis on public policy analysis and a Bachelor of Arts in political science. <laughs> Ernie Jolly, Congressional Fellow, Focus, Finance. Ernie is a graduate of American University's Washington College of Law and an alum of Cornell University, where he graduated cum laude from its American Studies program. <laughs> Latasha Lee, Lewis Stokes Urban Health Public Policy Fellow. Latasha is a native of Port St. Lucie, Florida. She'll be graduating from Florida Atlantic University with a PhD in Integrative Biology with an emphasis in Developmental Neuroscience. Daniela Henry, Donald M. Payne Foreign Policy Fellow. Daniela is a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Law, where she earned a Juris Doctorate and Human Rights Certificate. <laughs> Stephanie Osby, Congressional Fellow, Focus Energy. Stephanie is a native of Los Angeles and holds a Master of Science in Environmental Management with a concentration in Agriculture, Energy, and Environmental Policy from the University of San Francisco. <laughs> Brittany Rolera, Congressional Fellow, Focus, Energy. Brittany is a graduate of the Georgetown University Law Center and the University of Southern California and is committed to creating positive change through law, government, and public policy. <laughs> Antrell Tyson, Congressional Fellow, Focus, Science and Technology. Antrell is a native of Decatur, Georgia and a graduate of the University of Richmond T.C. Williams School of Law. Kinga Nad Nad Nadaji Kalur, Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders, a Yali Fellow. Kinga is one of 500 youth African leaders selected by the Obama administration. She is from the country of Chad with more than three years of experience in the public governance sector. Please join me in giving our fellows another round of applause. Thank you. Our fellows will be instrumental in compiling a summary of today's National Town Hall meeting for placement on our social media sites. We also launched yesterday a new tool that is designed to engage and inform our community on public policy issues impacting the African American community, the Permanence Project. The CBCF Permanence Project is a virtual community where public policy issues impacting the black community are discussed and dissected. The Permanence Project is built on a cloud-based web platform offering real-time analyses and resources on public policy issues that are discussed, debated, and voted into law on Capitol Hill and in legislative bodies around the nation. Through this online community, we will provide nonpartisan, unbiased, fact-based analyses, research, and resources about public policy issues, explore the implications of current public policy on black communities, facilitate the exchange of ideas and information to address critical long-term challenges affecting the African American and, black, and global black community, and also expand CBCF's ability to connect with its stakeholders. And if you would like to sign up to become a part of this community, I would encourage you to visit our website at cbcfinc.org backslash permanence project. 
I invite you also to join us at noon today for the opening of this year's exhibit showcase. Please be sure and visit all of our vendors. And if you have a corporate representative package, please enjoy our hospitality in room 204B, compliments of Sheridan and the Starwood family of hotels. And before I take my seat, I invite you to help us sustain the work that we do at CBCF. And you can do that right now by pulling out your cell phone. Everybody's got a smartphone in here, I know. We've made it easy for you. So help us invest in the next generation of leaders like the nine you just met, the 10 you just met this morning and text CBCF to 20222. That's 20222 to make a $10 donation. You will need to reply yes to the text message you receive and standard message and data rates may apply. Thank you all so much for being here with us this morning. I hope you enjoy the town hall and certainly the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2014 Annual Legislative Conference co-chairs, Representative Sanford Bishop, representing the second district of Georgia. Congressman Bishop is co-chair and co-founder of the Congressional Military Family Caucus and the Congressional Chicken Caucus. He is also a member of the Blue Dog Coalition, the Congressional Black Caucus, the House Army Caucus, and the Congressional USO Caucus. Representative Joyce Beatty, representing the 3rd District of Ohio. Congresswoman Beatty was appointed to the Financial Services Committee and serves on the subcommittees on Housing and Insurance and Oversight and Investigations. Additionally, for her first term, she was selected to serve as a Democratic Caucus Regional Whip for Region 10 that includes Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Good morning. It's always a very special treat to spend time with people who place their trust in us and spend your hard-earned dollars uh, to come to this event. Uh, we can always depend on you to let us know what's really on your minds and what's really happening in your lives. It is my privilege to serve as co-chair of this 44th Annual Legislative Conference along with my beautiful colleague, uh, Representative Joyce Beatty. Uh, we welcome you to this national discussion of voting for change and equal opportunity midterm elections, and the state of black America. Thank you so much, Representative Bishop. And I certainly want to add my sincere appreciation to all of you for being here today. You are our backbone and the hand that fans us. And the people we turn to when we really want to know the truth about what's happening in our communities. Thank you for your constant vigilance and your sage advice. And now, my colleague and my dear friend, Representative Bishop, will introduce our sponsor for this national town hall meeting and our distinguished moderator for today. Valerie Long is the International Executive Vice President of the Property Services Division of the Service Employees International Union. Her active leadership as an activist and organizer has been of benefit to our workforce, our communities, and ultimately our nation. She has risked arrest standing on the courage of her convictions, often engaging in nonviolent civil disobedience. She serves on the steering committee of Union Network International, property service section, a global union federation that represents more than one million workers united in 125 unions across 70 countries. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Valerie Long. Good morning. I am so proud um, on behalf of the Service Employees International Union to be co-sponsoring this event with the leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. You know, I had a granddaughter who was born last week. 
And I am so proud that your leadership and the leadership of um, the folks standing on this stage, Representative Fudge, Representative Shaka Fatah, and Shanice Washington, give my granddaughter a chance to have a decent life in the wake of Shelby versus Holder and voting rights being under attack, you are the only thing standing in the way of injustice being served. So thank you for your leadership. I really appreciate the fact that in the events that led to Ferguson that we're having this forum, these discussions are timely, they're important, and our leadership both in the streets and in forums like this are important to make a change in this country. While some of the issues that we faced 50 years ago still exist today, we have one thing now that we didn't have then. We have the opportunity and the right to vote. We have the opportunity and the right to protest. We have the opportunity and the right to put our policy and our steps into purpose under God and in this country that we fought so long and so many years to protect. And I expect that this room will join hands in the civil rights movement, it'll join hands with the labor movement, it'll join hands in the altogether progressive movement to make this country something we can all be proud of that we have fought and bled for. So I don't wanna take a whole lot more time because this panel is important and these discussions are important. And I hope that we leave this room more empowered more learned in the fights that we need to take on um, for this country and that we continue to vote, we continue to get our relatives to vote, and we continue to fight for my granddaughter and for all the grandchildren this room represents. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Valerie Long, for your message this morning and for allowing us to live the American dream. Let's give her another round of applause. And now I have the special honor. Our moderator is no stranger to the Congressional Black Caucus because we often find him publicly addressing the very issues that consume much of our time in Congress. Television and radio commentator and motivational speaker. Jeff Johnson enters the homes of millions of Americans each day. He is well respected by his peers, colleagues alike, which helps him to be one of the most sought after keynote speakers in America. Please join me in welcoming to the stage today's national town hall meeting moderator, my friend and a bad brother, Mr. Jeff Johnson. Good morning. You all can do better than that. Good morning. That's much better. It's an honor and privilege to be here and serve as moderator this morning. Uh, we have an unbelievable panel uh, with a number of individuals that have the gravitas and the experience to lead us not only in a great discussion, but to lead us hopefully to having marching orders as we go back uh, to our own places of residence as we're pushing people to engage not just in the fight for social justice, but to push toward the midterms of 2014. Before I introduce that panel, however, it is my honor uh, to bring forward someone that most of you, I believe, know. Um, and if you don't, you are in for a treat. Uh, for 27 years, she has represented California's 12th district in the House of Representatives. Um, she is the Democratic leader of the U.S. House uh, for the 113th Congress, excuse me. And she's focused on jumpstarting the middle class by creating jobs here and at home uh, and around the country, expanding affordable access to education and empowering America's women and families. Uh, anybody who has worked with her or worked around her understands the power that she brings to every situation. And in a time where we continue to need fighters, not just in the house, but around the country, she continues to be one of those fighters that is not always, always on issue, but is always in the face of those that sometimes need someone in their face, if some of y'all hear me. Um, it is my honor and privilege to introduce Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi. 
Good morning. It is an honor to be here with this distinguished panel, with the leadership of the foundation. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. We're about to hear a, a wonderful, wonderful presentation and exchange of ideas about something so very fundamental, the right to vote. So I will be brief. Dr. King said, one of the most significant steps we can take is the short walk to the voting booth. And that is what we all have to do in the election. A few weeks ago, we had the privilege of bestowing the Congressional Gold Medal on Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. It was so remarkable because it was so overdue, but also because at the very same time, we were appealing to our colleagues to pass the Bipartisan Voting Rights Act to correct the Shelby decision. That still hasn't happened. We must make it happen, but in order to make that happen, we all must vote. As I said, it's a privilege to be here to accept the invitation of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Uh, another privilege I had uh, more than a year ago was stand on the steps with the Congressional Black Caucus uh, this, our very distinguished chair, Congresswoman Marcia Fudge, and members of C CBC, on the steps of the Supreme Court. We were there calling upon the court to make the right decision. That very day, we were meeting in the House of Representatives to dedicate the statue of Rosa Parks. It just seems so strange. We're dedicating a statue to Rosa Parks. People turn out in a bipartisan way to salute her, and yet we have to appeal to the court to do the right thing. And when they don't, they come and sing the praises of Martin Luther King and Credit Scott King, but don't pass the Voting Rights Act. So we have important work to do, and we have important people doing it. The, the distinguished chair of the foundation, uh, Chaka Fatah, has been working for children, for children, for children, for cities, for the American people. He's a great leader. Marsha Fudge, a very strong leader and fighter uh, for opportunity for all in our country and taking the lead on fighting for food stamps and the rest uh, in, in a very, very tough battle, but who better than she to lead on that score and so many others. Our ranking, our uh, assistant leader, Mr. Clyburn, a champion on the Voting Rights Act, he along with John Conyers working so hard for us to get that passed. Our chairman, Mr. Cumming, Mr. Conyers being one of them, Mr. Cummings, working very hard uh, to make sure to set the record straight as, as uh, some in Congress would constantly be on the attack of President Barack Obama. Benny Thompson, our chair uh, of, of Homeland, our ranking member, uh, uh, hopefully soon to be chair of the Homeland Security Committee to keep America safe, Maxine Waters, distinguished chair of financial services, uh, looking out for consumers and, and uh, uh, our financial system so that it's fair to everyone. Eddie Bernice Johnson, all of the talk that we've heard about science, technology, and math. She's the chair of the Science and Technology Committee. The Congressional Black Caucus has provided such tremendous leadership to our country. We will have a new member. Bobby Scott will be the chairman of the education, I say chairman, optimistically, but he will be the top Democrat on the Education and Labor Committee following up on his important work for young people and workers in our country. So this caucus is, ma is making a valuable contribution to our country. Even some who are not chairs of the caucus or committees, uh, Matt Emanuel Cleaver and, and uh, uh, Congresswoman Clay uh, were there in Ferguson and made us all so proud as they represented us in a way that was appropriate and respectful of the very serious nature of what happened there. And they, along with John Lewis, whom you'll be hearing from, the conscience of the Congress they call the Black Caucus, he's certainly very much a part of that. But so much needs to be done. Ferguson, say the word, conjures up so much that needs to be done. 
Voting Rights Act, freeing people to vote, that have the right to vote with, uh, with respect for who they are. So I thank Shanice Washington and Jeff Johnson for, for their leadership, Valerie Long, so many people who are making today possible. As I said, it's an honor uh, for me to be here to salute the members of the Congressional Black Caucus led by Marsha Fudge in the Congress, Chaka Fatah uh, with the foundation. And how about those fellows that we met? And how about the fact that some of the fellowships were named for name for Donald Payne, for Donald Payne, that beautiful, lovely man, and uh, for Congressman Stokes, Chairman Stokes, a distinguished leader. And so the tradition goes on about education, which is key to the fulfillment of these young people, which is also necessary for uh, to keep America number one. And I'll just leave you with one thought. One way we hope to turn out a big vote in all communities, and the vote in this, uh, the uh, uh, Congressional Black Caucus leadership community is so important, is what Jeff said. It's about jobs, keeping good paying, jumpstart the middle class, good paying jobs here in America, investing in education to keep num America number one. And that means we have to invest heavily in historical black colleges as well as reduce the cost of loans to kids. And the and the very important part of it to, to the community is when women succeed, America succeeds. That's how we think we're going to turn out a big vote. Thank you for the honor of having a chance to say a few words. This is good luck in your deliberations. We're all counting on you, and I know the success of this conference will be the success of our country. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, and, and she said it right. The, the panel that we are getting ready to go into is going to cover um, ambitiously uh, three key areas. One is the state of uh, the African-American vote moving into 2014, uh, the necessity to look at both voting and law enforcement reform as it relates to policy, and then also uh, where we are going and how the black vote affects us socioeconomically. Uh, that's a lot to cover in a short amount of time, but we have a brilliant panel that's going to do that. And I'm gonna be introducing um, folks that are in the audience every now and again. You know how we are. Uh, we gotta do shout outs. Uh, but uh, Congresswoman Beatty said that I'm no stranger to the Congressional Black Caucus. And if I could just take a, a point of personal privilege, I think it's important because it's not just been for me about supporting the jobs tour that the Congressional Black Caucus did or getting on the road to be able to support different members in certain parts of the country. It's that before anybody knew me, when I was a senior in high school in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, there was a woman who was a county prosecutor by the name of Stephanie Tubbs Jones. And... She came into my high school government class and blew me away. And I said to myself, uh, I need to work for her. And I asked my teacher if I could walk her to her car as she was leaving the classroom. Uh, and I said to, at that time, Prosecutor Tubbs Jones, I said, uh, you're gonna hire me. And, and anybody that knows her knows that look, uh, like, what are you talking about? I don't know you. Uh, she said, are you a lawyer? I said, no. She said, I only hire lawyers. Come back to me after you go to law school. I said, uh, well, lawyers have files, right? She said, yes. I said, you got a file room where those files are. She said, yes. I said, you need somebody to get files for lawyers in that file room. She, she said, you're funny. Come see me on Monday. And she hired me in the file room of the county prosecutor's office in Cleveland, Ohio, and that set up a trajectory for me to be where I am. And so I, I just felt it was necessary. We talked about honoring those that have come before. And Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones was one of the most powerful black women that we've seen in the halls of Congress. And on days like today, I just remember her so much and want to lift her up. And so it's my honor and privilege to introduce those that will lead us in our discussion today. Um, please hold your applause till the end. 
Wade Henderson is president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund. As a tireless civil rights leader and advocate, he is a member of the Bar in the District of Columbia and the United States Supreme Court. Elaine Jones was first female president and director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. She is a legal powerhouse and a civil rights lawyer who was elected to the American Bar Association Board of Governors in 1989, the first African American to do so. In December of 2000, President Clinton presented her with the Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Award. Representative John Lewis was elected to Congress in 1986 and represents the 5th Congressional District of Georgia. This civil rights leader was a freedom writer, spoke at the 1963 March on Washington in 2011, and he also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Barbara Onwine is President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, a graduate of Duke University Law School. She continues to champion civil rights and racial justice issues nationally and internationally. She specializes in the areas of housing and lending, community development, employment, voting rights, education, and environmental justice. Representative Javier Becerra is the chairman of the House Democratic Caucus. He's a former Deputy Attorney General with the California Department of Justice and was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1992. He's a member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, where he served as chair during the 105th Congress. Rep Representative Becerra is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. And last but certainly not least uh, is a leader who I met while I was working in that file room in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, <laughs> she was chief of staff at that time, but she is a unbelievable public servant yeah, yeah. from my home state representing the 11th Congressional District in such an unbelievable way. Uh, she chairs the Congressional Black Caucus and is continuing on every single level to be an unbelievable freedom fighter even as she is a powerful legislator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Representative Marsha Fudge. All right. <laughs> you all please have a seat. Now, I have to ask an unbelievable favor. Uh, as we are addressing these three major themes of the state of the black vote, of the necessity to look at reform of voting and law enforcement policy, and how the vote is affecting African Americans socioeconomically, I need you all to be mindful that this <laughs> panel ends today. <laughs> Um, and so if you could think, as master tweeters do, to be short and prolific uh, in your responses, we will have a great panel. I would like to start um, with Representative Lewis, if I can. Uh, Congressman Lewis, uh, th there is clearly an impact that uh, recent legislation in particular uh, and civil rights and, and, and Supreme Court cases have had on voting rights and voting rights for African Americans. What have the last two years in particular done for the, to the African American electorate? Hmm. And more importantly, if there is one thing that all of us need to be doing moving into November, what is that one thing? Well, more than anything else, the decision of the United States Supreme Court and local state officials all across America, not just in the southern states, have made a deliberate effort to take us back to another period. And we must stand up and, and fight and push by going to the polls and vote like we never voted before. I've said in the past that the vote is precious. It's almost sacred. It controls everything that we do, everything. And as a minority, whether we be black, a Latino, a Asian American, a Native American, or whether we are white, we must understand that 50 years ago, this year, three young men that I knew, I Andy Goodman, Mika Sherman, and James Shaney, gave their lives trying to make it possible for all of our citizens to become participants in the democratic process. So we got to go out and vote. If we want to respond to Ferguson, we got to vote. It is powerful. 
You got to do it and we must do it. If not, we're gonna go backward. Even as we begin that fight and, and, and many in this room and around the country have consistently been engaged in ensuring that we're registered, ensuring that, that folks are edu edu educated and making sure that there's robust GOTV. But Congresswoman Fudge, th th there is I think a debate that's happening even in our community. Um, as we're looking at what happened with the Supreme Court decision, do we continue to fight for federal uh, voter laws or do we more focus on state laws that we're losing in many cases all over the country? Is it, an, is it a both end proposition or as we move forward into a new space and time, is it an either or proposition due to lack of resources, limited resources, and the fact that we continue to get beat up on the state level, even when we have some federal protection? Uh, let me say two things. First off, let me thank you as well as to say to this audience that he's a little modest. When he came to work in the prosecutor's office, he was a world-class track athlete. So he was not only bright, he was doing all of the right things, the things that we want our young people to do. So I thank you uh, for still being who you are. Uh, as it relates to, um, it's, an, it's not an either or. You know, when we were kids, we used to say, I can walk and chew bubble gum at the same time. Uh, and we can, we can work on both tracks. I think that if we don't, we make a huge mistake. The reason we are in, in, in the shape we're in partially is because of redistricting. And we did that because we lost the state houses. If we had not lost the state houses, we may be in a much better position than we are today. But I think that the thing that people need to understand is what is at stake in this election? I mean, we know that we need to vote and we all know why we need to vote, but let me just say these few things, if I may. If we don't vote, believe it or not, they are going to file articles of impeachment against our president. If we don't vote, the street in front of your house is not gonna get fixed. If we don't vote, we're going to have hungry children across this country because they're going to keep cutting, snap, and wick. Uh, we have to understand that this election is about us. It is not about the people who are running. It is about the policies that we need to be supporting. If you don't vote, I just say you're selfish and sorry. So let's go tell the people to go out here and vote. <laughs> Congressman Becerra, to, to Congresswoman Fudge's point, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. But if, if we are, even those of us that are inside the political bubble, are looking around, I hear conversation every day about the need to secure the seats in the House and potentially move some seats forward. I hear about securing the Senate um, and ensuring that, that Democrats stay on the front end there for those that are playing po party politics but I don't hear the same level of fervor and enthusiasm about down ballot candidates that are drastically going to affect quality of life in states all over the country. Mm -hmm. As we talk about walking and chewing gum at the same time, how can we ensure that we're doing the kind of work that leads people to the polls, that push forward the kind of representatives we want in the House and Senate, but not at the cost of poorly educating folks on those down ballot seats, many of whom still have an opportunity to win in certain states? Jeff, let me begin by first saying thank you for being here and for uh, allowing me to be with all these great leaders that are here. To the point, I, I think Marsha hit it right on the money there, and I, I think Congressman Lewis gave us the, the proper perspective. What we find is that after 2008 and 2012, when the black vote set historic numbers, that Republicans went on the offense, and they said, we gotta stop this. And so they've been playing offense for the last four years, and they've been going after that vote, not by trying to persuade you not to vote, by not making it possible for you to vote. Right. And so what we gotta stop is playing defense. We're fighting the Supreme Court decisions. We're fighting to change laws at state and federal levels. And so what we should do is take the offense. I don't think you're gonna take the offense only if you concentrate at the federal or at the local level, as Marcia said, you gotta do both, and, and, and Jeff, I think the response here is, we gotta teach our young folk that voting is a right, but it's not just a right, it's a right of passage. If you don't vote, it's like, you, don't wanna, you wanna learn how to drive? It's a right of passage, you gotta show me that you deserve to drive that car. You wanna be a man? You wanna be a leader, a woman or man who's leading this country? You gotta show me that you know the importance of voting. 
And so it's got to be a conviction that it is a rite of passage for our young folks to vote. That means we got to teach them. And I don't think it makes any difference if it's a city council seat or if it's a congressional seat or if it's for the president of the United States. Our young folks have to understand the value of voting for that little town hall uh, city council person or for the president of the United States. When we do that, it makes no difference how these anti-voters want to push us. We will be on the offense and we will win. Thank you, Cong Congressman. Barbara, I I'm concerned because I, I, I hear Congressman Becerra and, and I agree. But as someone who has worked at the NAACP, People for the American Way, a number of the or other organizations at the national level, and even worked on the pop culture side mm. to engage young voters, I hear the language of voting being important. And I hear it specifically during targeted periods. But if we're talking about offense, in many cases, the enemy that many of us are fighting never takes a day off. <laughs> when do we move Whoa. beyond this notion that mm -hmm. fighting for the vote starts and ends somewhere around the time campaigning starts? Mm -hmm. right. And that whether it's our churches, our civic organizations, and our leadership begin to be, have, me have messages and movements that don't turn on and off. That we engage funders so that funders aren't only funding during periods of time. How do we create yes. a movement that is larger, more comprehensive, and more 360 than frankly we've seen in, in several decades? Thank you <laughs> for that question. I because, figured you would like that. <laughs> <laughs> because listen, everyone, voting has to be 365 days a year. It cannot only be about showing up for an election, although that's key, mm -hmm. because that's how you manifest it. You know, if you don't give a gift on Christmas, well, you know, what happened? So the most important thing for people right now is for, we know, Jeff, that for every one of us who knows that November 4th is election day, that four other people have no idea, not a clue, mm -hmm. not a clue, our duty is to create the massive microphone to get the word out to every single person we know. My mother's 83 years old. She will be on the phone calling everybody in our family saying, honey child, <laughs> are you registered? Because registration is gonna start cutting off for some states as early as October the 7th. So it's very important that we get that word out and she's going to be on the phone on early voting and election day calling all of my family saying, you better get ready. You got to get to those polls. But see, we got to do that. And we don't do that just by talking. I want to make sure that everybody here knows that we come here today to bring you tools that help you do that. The Lawyers Committee, the Leadership Conference, the NAACP, LDF, all of us, all of our organizations work together. National Action Network, the National Coalition for Black Civic Participation. We put out toolkits that every community group can use. We have a new one that just came out on civic engagement this week and another one for faith-based communities, another one for youth voters. Uh, but what I want to make sure of is that what those toolkits do is that they talk about not only registering GOTV, the vote, you know, what's going on in the local communities, but they also talk about this issue, about making sure that people stay engaged. Because the problem is, the reason why so many people don't want to go to the polls is they get disgusted with putting people in office who don't do what they were put in office to do. And they get angry when they see that they're not at the school board level making sure their children have the best education. They get upset when the mayor isn't holding the police force accountable. But, they but get let me, upset let me interject about there. that. Let me so interject that's there. why we gotta make sure that people are held accountable and that we're engaged in this process all the time. 
No, because because I, I think you make a great point. Thank you very much. And, and, and wait, if you can build on that, because my yeah. concern is, yeah. yes. again, we throw out the word accountability yeah. all the time. Yes. Um, and so why are we holding mayors accountable? Why are we holding sure. school members accountable? Why are we holding state legislators accountable? But in cities that have 2,000 churches, um, very few of those members attend a city council meeting. Yeah. Um, in right. places where we have activist organizations, right. a lot of times they don't show up at the state legislature. That's what we need. And so yeah. my question is how yes. do we begin to better engage folks to do what I think okay. Barbara is talking about on a consistent basis? Jeff, it's a great question. Uh, I'm honored to be here, honored to be a part of this conversation. Very important. Look, voting really is the language of democracy, guys. Uh, if you don't vote, you don't count. That's number one. Number two, voting should be a nonpartisan issue. It's a national issue. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, partisanship, and particularly a corrosive, toxic kind of partisanship, has subverted the right to vote and democracy as we know it. I want to give just a brief history lesson of why this issue is important, okay? And then after you do and that, then, tell me the how. Yeah, I'm going to tell you the how. <laughs> Look, when President Obama was elected in 2008, he shattered every record about voter turnout and participation. In North Carolina, you had a huge turnout of African Americans. In Virginia, in Indiana, it was mind-blowing. But on the night he won the 2008 election, Robert Draper, a, an author who created a book don't ask us what we do. The U.S. House of Representatives documented a dinner that took place in Washington where Paul Ryan, Kevin McCarthy, the current whip of the House of Representatives, Newt Gingrich, and others came together to talk about not just how to regain power, but how to subvert President Obama's legislative agenda. That was on the night of his inaugural ball. In September of 2009, an obscure congressman from South Carolina by the name of Joe Wilson, who was attending a joint session of the House and Senate, yelled out during a presidential address, you lie, you lie. It was an attack on the presidency and it was an attack on President Obama. He was rewarded with a nine point victory and a war chest of untold proportions generated by what he did. And in, in March of 2010, Tea Party activists came to town and spit on Congressman Emanuel Cleaver, talked, ra hurled racial epithets at John Lewis and other members, and argued that this was really a free exercise of their right to express their views. I mention all of this for the following reason. This is a concerted effort to subvert the president's agenda. It began on the night of his first election. The failure on the part of black voters to respond in 2010, as we responded in 2008, cost us everything. We lost That's control right. of state houses. We right. lost control of our ability to set the state agenda, and we're still paying the price. Okay, so with all of that. Yeah, what do we do? And Thank you. Well, because because I I, I, I I would love if, if we could put up the the slides that that show some of the black voter turnout and the yeah. variances yeah. Um, between 2010 and 2012, and, and those can, will come up. But but my concern is still about yeah. the how, because well, a lot of times, let, let, really quickly, yeah. we talk about the electorate, what the yeah. electorate didn't do. Yeah. But a lot of times, I didn't see resources, I didn't see infrastructure, I didn't see organizations, yeah. in large part, pushing to ensure that that turnout was going to be at the same level. Resources for advocacy in the black community and organizing the electorate are scarce. They have not been devoted by the national uh, party structure as they should be. So guys, come on now, be real. Uh, we know that your vote is always sought uh, at election time, but there is no infrastructure on the part of the national party to support organizing in the black community. Now, hey, I'm not here in a partisan role. I'm not here to stole one party or the other. I am saying our interests should determine how we cast our vote. And in the event that we don't vote, we are ultimately harmed. So here's the connection. When you look at the states that have failed to provide Medicaid assistance under the generous provisions of the Obamacare bill, states get three years of federal support. It's an inducement 
to have states join the Medicaid uh, debate. Most of the people who are affected by Medicaid are poor people, black people, white people, Latinos. The states that are denying them that right are largely in the South. The truth is, we can't get health care and we desperately need it, and our vote will determine whether that is carried out. So let me, let me do this, because yeah. Elaine, I'd like you to come in and, and for you to deal with the how. Um, because I'm, I'm curious about how, because I think everything that, that um, Wade brought up was, was poignant. But, but I'm interested in, for those of us that are in Cincinnati, or those that are in yeah. Indianapolis, or those that are in Pittsburgh, or those that are in Oakland, wherever they may be, how do we begin to see 365 day engagement in a voter process that creates a culture of civic engagement, not just an activity of voting? Can I say something to that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. We need to be half as good as our forefathers and foremothers. We just need to be half as good. My goodness. They didn't have a degree. They didn't have college graduations. They didn't have high school. But I'm telling you, when black men first got the right to vote in 1870, Black women didn't get into 50 years later, 1920. But in 1870, those brothers, five years out of slavery, five years out of slavery, with their little holes in their hats and their little turned over shoes and their little collars, wrapped themselves around the pole for 25 years. They didn't miss a vote. And they elected 24 black men to the Congress by themselves because they didn't need to be educated on the, that we live in a democracy. <laughs> they didn't need that. Yes. They understood that. Five years, elected 24 black people to Congress. The powers that be have always understood the promise and the strength of the black vote if it is exercised. In our hands, we have the seed of our own liberation. Amen. And we do not use it. Now, you have to talk about what gets us out there, what is it that we can do, what's the organization? No. We got out there and voted for Barack Obama in 2008. Big time. Big time. What, what did that? We Big got out there. Because what we do, we vote for people. We don't vote for issues. And in Barack Obama, we had the issue and the person combined so we could come out. That's right. You remove the African-American president, state level, federal level. It's all connected. We get myopia. We can't see anything. We don't educate ourselves as to what's going on in our community. Fergus, Missouri is an abomination. Right. 67% black vote, 67% population, and 6% percent voter turnout. Turn out. It's a wonder you got any blacks on the police force. Uh, I mean, so, so we have been fighting for the right to vote and to hold on to the vote ever since we first got it in 1870. It's nothing new, it's always been under attack. When did the Supreme Court decide they were going to review the Voting Rights Act case? Three days That's right. after Obama was elected in 2012. Okay. Three days! So, I mean, it, we, we, uh, the foundations don't fund it. All right, they don't fund it. Right. The people don't organize us. All right, we're not organized. That's right. It's our individual duty to self-educate. Yeah. Self yeah. 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 Yep. And okay. it is our duty to organize and educate others. And it's local. Yes. It begins at home. Everybody. The community meetings. Jeff is right. The school board. The yes. West. Black people should be known as the most politically active, active. folk in this in nation. Country. When they look at us 
and we over 18, they ought to automatically know that we are voting. And so it's, it's ours. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Elaine, what I need you to do next time, I need to hear more passion. <laughs> you're, you're not passionate enough. We need a little more energy. Some passion. Oh! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. All right, my sister. Congresswoman Fudge, and, and I know Congresswoman Fudge, you have to transition, but, but I, have, I have a sticky question. Um, I know normally you can deal with sticky questions, and, and, and Wade brought up something that I think is important, and that is that oftentimes even Democrats treat the African-American community like baseball fans who only watch the World Series. They just show up in October. That's right. That's right. And so how do we begin? Because I, I, I think Elaine really dealt with the fact that there's some self-internal issues that we need to deal with yeah. if we're going to mobilize. But there also is support issues from those who we support. And so how do we engage the Democratic Party in a more effective way of supporting candidates that we can see have a chance of winning but don't get broader support and this unbelievable infrastructure, some of which people in this room represent, of people that work in the political space and are always brought into meetings to give free advice, but never hired yeah. as consultants uh, uh, within okay. this electoral infrastructure. All right. You know, J Jeff, really the, the, the answer is really easy. Uh, Self-preservation is uh, human nature. Mm -hmm. And so when they have finally realized that 45% of the vote of the Democratic Party is minority, then they pay attention. Mm -hmm. When they realize that they want to hold the Senate and realize that in Louisiana, they need our vote and it's 30% mm -hmm. of the vote in Louisiana. 30% of the people in Louisiana are black people. Uh, in, in Alabama, almost the same. In Georgia, almost the same. In North Carolina, almost mm -hmm. the same. <clears throat> I was in Arkansas on Monday I mean, Sunday. Arkansas only 15%, but in a close race, 15% is a lot That's of a votes. Difference. So now that they realize that not only do they just need us just like they've always needed us, come on, black folk, y'all come on out here and support the Democratic right. Party. Once they realize that we can really make a difference, we then went to them. They didn't have to come to us, and we said, now, you want us? We are players in this game. And so right now, the DSCC is getting ready to spend $60 million on the ground in seven states. Guess who's going to get some of that money now? We're going to get some of that I money I hope now. so. <clears throat> the DNC supported our Freedom Sunday effort. We hit oh, almost 3,000 churches last Sunday to talk about getting out the vote. I think it is just important that you have to make people do what's right sometimes. Right. Uh, we expect them to do what's right, but see, we expected that of the master too. We expected yeah. them to take care of us because we were worth something, had some value. But sometimes you have to make them do it. And now we're making them do it. Yeah. Because if they don't, then they lose. Because I'm going to tell you what, my life ain't going to change a whole lot, personally. But what will change is my neighbors when, they, when their kids can't eat yeah. or when they can't keep a roof over their head. So we are saying to the Democratic Party, all three houses of the Democratic Party, you better pay attention to us because if you don't, everybody loses. If we win, everybody wins. If we lose, everybody loses when black folk don't vote. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. And at, at this time, um, I, we're going to shift gears a little bit and I want to talk about uh, what's on a lot of people's minds. Many of you have seen in the last 24 hours that people were in the streets in Ferguson, yes. uh, that there's conversation right now about uh, protesters blocking the St. Louis Cardinals game uh, as they go into the playoffs. But there's also right now a video that was released of John Crawford shooting in yes. Ohio, yes. in a Walmart, uh, where it was said he was, the police stated he was a gun-wielding individual but it was a gun that was sold in Walmart that he was getting ready to buy. And I think as many of us said, because we had seen, we had heard about the video, um, that there was no warning, uh, that the police didn't identify themselves, uh, that he was shot from behind the first time, that he was killed in many cases, what they believe was a second shot. And so Ferguson is a example 
of what's happening in cities all over the country that either no one catches on video or it doesn't bubble to the surface. So I'd like to, to uh, Barbara, if you can chime in first uh, to deal with, and, and actually, if, if I can pause for a second, Congressman Lewis, if, if you can chime in for a second, because clearly there are policy issues as it relate to the militarization of local police. Oh. There's policies as it relates to what uh, the, the rules for excessive force are, but more importantly, and what I think communities are concerned with, yeah. how do yeah. we create policy that hold police accountable in substantive ways versus superficial ways mm -hmm. so we don't continue to see people that shoot someone and tomorrow they're back on the street That's or right. they're on paid mm -hmm. leave. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's important, I think it is a must that we become organized all across America with the ability and the capacity to speak up and not wait till there's an incident. But during the 60s, we didn't have a website. Uh -uh. We didn't know anything <laughs> about the internet. Facebook? Mm -mm. We, we, we didn't have a fax machine. <laughs> That's right. We had an old mimograph machine. Mm -hmm. And we brought about a nonviolent revolution. Yes, sir. A revolution of values, a revolution of ideas. I think in many of our communities, we're just too darn quiet. We, we need to make some noise. Yes. We Congress, need to we can... organize and organize. We, we have to use the vote, yes. But we have to organize discipline Campaigns. Before that was a sit-in, a freedom ride, a march, we studied, we prepared ourselves. That, that was my next question to you, because I, I, I get concerned when I hear uh, elders sometimes talk about the lack of engagement of young people, but there isn't a real historical analysis of the fact that your generation got trained and you couldn't be on the front lines of SNCC if you weren't trained. You couldn't be at a lunch counter if you weren't trained. And so, can we you talk- We couldn't Freedom Ride. We were trained. The 13 of us were trained before we boarded a Greyhound bus or Trailway bus to travel from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. And you all weren't using some sophisticated, multi-million dollar funded institute. No. So I'm interested in knowing how, for those that are working with young people or college students that are interested in moving them to address the vote or moving them to address issues of police brutality, what are some ways that we can actually do the training that helps springboard consistent leadership, not just passionate leadership? I think we need to recruit a cadre of young people, gifted, yes, smart, yes, but the average Joes, and prepare them to be prepared to stand up and speak up and organize the unorganized and be prepared to mobilize. I want to go back one, just one little point. The vote, if we want to change Ferguson and other places, we got to use the vote. It's the most powerful, nonviolent tool we have in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. If we fail to use it, we're going to go backward. Mm -hmm. uh, Congressman Becerra, and, and then I'll come back to you, Barbara. I'm, I, uh, Elaine talked about something that was critical, and that is that in so many cases, communities of color vote for people first and policy second. Yes. Um, I don't often see candidate incubators that are looking for young talent outside of the party system. Um, I'm not sure about the work that you are doing, but, but how do we begin to, and I don't mean just brilliant college students that are showing effective matriculation through undergraduate institutions. I'm talking about youngins that be philosophizing on the block. Yeah. And that philosophizing is connected to a political platform because they care about something. And then we got the ability to take them and pull them in. What are ways that we create candidate incubators and electoral incubators so that we're seeing a different feeder pool of folks going into city council, school board, state ledge, and even mayor's races? Jeff, one of the things that we often hear is when you like, take a look at someone's office or the people that he or she hires, they always say, well, I try, I try to find a good person of minority background, but they're not out there or they don't come to me. I'm the chairman of the Democratic Caucus. The majority of my staff on the Democratic Caucus are people of color and women. And I had no trouble finding any of them and they are as talented That's right. as anybody out there. And so you just gotta push the envelope. You can't let people get away with the excuse. But, but Jeff, I, I, I agree, but not completely with the, issue, uh, the notion that we vote based on the person. I think we vote based on our existential ability to survive. 
When Ferguson occurred, I think people said, that's me. When the civil rights movement got strong, people said, that's me. And that's when people came out. But then what happened was you had success. We saw that we got the Civil Rights Act passed. We saw that we got the Voting Rights Act passed. And we said, we got what we were looking for. And we got complacent. And we sat. And we didn't teach the next generation, the John Lewis's of the world, to be ready for the next time. Because we knew whether it would be a next time. And it's coming up all the time. And Ferguson was just one example. And so what I think we have to do is... You know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. And so we got to start with them young because it's tough to change bad habits. And we got to teach our young folks never to have that bad habit. And I would say one th other thing. If we don't put some of our own money, our own skin in the game on voter Reg, not just depend on whether the parties are going to do it for us, but our own money, we're never going to fully get there because the parties will only do it, as we said, every year that there's an election. We need it to be done every year of that child's life so that when they get to be 18, like I said, it's just like getting driver's license. You know you're going to go out and vote as well because it's a right of power. Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Let me build on what Javier just said. And I'm going to say it a little differently. I think when I listen to Mr. Lewis and, and Wade and Elaine and we hear the passion and we talk about our history, I think what happens is we get comfortable. But let me speak to some of the younger folks in the office audience, because what Mr. Lewis said was they were trained. They were trained because they felt the conviction and it affected them. So my message to your resolve is whether you're on the more mature end of this audience, when you get that corner corporate office, you remember that there's somebody that needs to be in the foul room. And when you get there with all of your credentials, you have to remember that there is someone your contemporary. And what I'm saying is you get the one person in the corporate office or at the highest level and they don't bring people along. And so then we emulate, when our young folks come along, they emulate what our leaders in those environments are doing because we like all the attention on us. When Mr. Lewis and everybody was marching, it was never about him. It was about the cause. When 22 black women 101 years ago had the courage to convince a president of the United States to let them be the only women of color to march in the women's suffrage march. It wasn't about them, it was about the cause. So I agree on the people, but it's always about the cause. So this forum, you're in here for free. You will attend things late in the evening for free. Mm. So everything you have for free, you then write a check back to the cause. All right. Whether it's to the NAACP, whether it is to the caucus that you prefer, but there are no free rides. <coughs> Mr. Lewis and all of his contemporaries, they didn't ask anybody for a dime to feed them. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask anybody to get them a bus ticket to get on the bus. When Rosa Parks created the modern civil rights movement, for one year, black folks didn't get on a bus. Could you imagine today if Joyce Beatty said to you, stand with this group and walk for a week, what would happen? So we have to go old school. And lastly, that's why we're doing this panel with Jeff, because we stand on the shoulders of someone. You stand on the shoulders of someone. Right. It's time for us to give a shoulder so our young folks can stand on hey. it. Thank you. Thank you. And Barbara, if I can, because I think that there is, yes. if you ask somebody to, to walk with you for a week, if, if I remember so much of what, what made the bus boycott so brilliant was it was just start with one day. And I think what we're seeing in Ferguson that I'm pleased about is we're seeing young and old That's people alike right. on the ground that aren't waiting for anybody to come back, That's right. that aren't waiting for a national leader to come in, that aren't waiting for somebody to tell them how to do it, and there's continuity that we're starting to see. But, but how do we begin, what are the issues, if you will, on the policy side as it relates to 
police brutality mm -hmm. that help turn the needle? Is it civilian review boards? Is it blocking federal funding? What are the things that people should be looking for mm -hmm. from a policy piece so when they're going to the polls, they know what to look for by way of ways to end this at the local level? Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I want everyone to know that there is a unified statement that has been put out by at least 15 civil rights organizations on Ferguson reforms, on police reforms nationwide. And I wanted to be very clear that this is not a letter talking about we abhor and we're so annoyed and we're so disgusted and we're angry. This is a letter that says federal government, state government, local government, do these 14 things and we won't be burying our children every single three days. Do you know that in August alone, police shot and killed over 102 people? I think we need to understand that this is not a moment, as Reverend Yearwood says, that it is about a movement, that this is the work of our generation. Mm -hmm. This is the work that we have to get done. So I want you to know that you can become a signatory to this statement. You can get copies of the statement. Some of them are outside of this hall. They're also at booth number 230 in the exhibit hall. And I want you to sign up. I want you to go to lawyerscommittee.org and become a signatory. But also what I wanted to say is that to all the questions you've been asking, Jeff. The beauty of the moment that we sit in, let's not miss where we are right now in this moment and where we're going in the future. I wanna give a shout out to all my young brothers and sisters who created handsupdontshoot.org. I mean, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I wanna give a shout out to all of my brothers and sisters from Dream Defenders, Black Youth Project, Black Lives Matter. I wanna give a shout out because those brothers and sisters have done it with no dimes. They got no buses and figured out how to get from New York to Ferguson. They got no buses and figured out how to get from Florida to whatever. Atlanta. They've done it. And I want us to be very clear that they, we got a youth, a generation that is like Jaziri X and all of the others that are using their talents. Dar Dar you know, Darnell Moore and Charlene Carruthers and Philip Agnew and all of these brothers and sisters who are standing up because they understand that this is not just an issue about black men, it's an issue about <clears throat> Black boys, it's an issue about black women and black girls. My God, two days after the shooting of Mike Brown, police shot and killed in Phoenix, Arizona. Michelle Casso, who was 50 years old, mentally disabled, had a hammer in her hand and they decided to shoot her 20 times. The community was so disgusted that 300 people marched with her casket and they took it to the city hall and put it in the middle of the road time, mm -hmm. in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Let's be very clear that <clears throat> everywhere in this country, black people are rising mm -hmm. up. That we are standing up and saying no more killings of our people, but we need, we need these systematic and institutional reforms. We need to dig deep and fight to make sure that the change happens, that I'm not sitting here on a panel next year talking about the latest people they shot and killed. No, <coughs> my brothers and sisters, we can stop this by getting the racial guidance yeah. passed, by getting the funding taken away from departments that have histories and clearly are engaging in police brutality. We can change it by making all these places wear their cameras so the true story gets out by having dash cams on police cars, by forcing people to keep statistics on who's being shot and killed, by making simple changes about knowing who in fact is employed, by having community civil, civilian review boards that are real, not just jive, 
that are powerful, that can subpoena and punish, that have the ability to have community policing instead of broken windows that makes it racial profiling legal. These are the things that we got to do. Listen, I stand here because you know that my family was invaded by a SWAT team, came into my home at five o'clock at night. You think Ferguson had some military gear? <laughs> Please. They came in with night goggles. I kept saying, turn on the lights. You're going to kill some of my people. Turn on the lights but they wanted to play with their night goggles, their shields, all the rest of the stuff that they did for my family, held us under armed guard for three hours while they, quote, executed a search warrant that they couldn't produce. These are the realities. We need to be very, very clear about the moment that we're in. I don't want us to ever forget, Jeff, that as Thank black hens, you know, as we, you know, Black Lives Matter, hands up, don't shoot us. We created those organizations. We can create the organizations you're talking about. That we need to have a 365 uh, uh, you know, day review on what's going on politically at our local, state, and federal level. That we can hold people accountable. We got the technology, we got the means, we just have to do the work. And I know in this audience, Elaine, that seed you talked about, they're right here. And they're going to take what they learned today and change it into a new yes. America. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes. What I want to do is, is I want to ask one more question, but I hate when we have three minutes left and then we open the floor uh, and only two people get to ask questions. Uh -oh. So there is a mic in the middle uh, here that will be available for those that want to ask questions. We will get to as many as we can, which is why I want to open it as quickly as possible. Uh, but if you would begin to line up there in the center aisle uh, following this question, and this is for both Wade and Elaine. The, we wanted to talk about this, that what is the socioeconomic impact of voting on African Americans? Yeah. And, and so Wade, I'd, I'd like for you to just talk about some of the small ways that we're impacted because there's so many. But Elaine, could you also talk about something that, that <coughs> Representative Becerra talked about, which is how do we financially inf in, in, uh, impact mm -hmm. the voting process um, and what we can do to play a more sophisticated game on fundraising, on donating to the kind of candidates that we want, and on playing a fundraising role within parties if we so choose to play the role in that space. Wait and then Elaine. G guys, I, I guess I would say, look, <clears throat> voting obviously matters, and here's a good example. Eric Holder, who is now the Attorney General of the United States, would not be in office were it not for Barack Obama. Without Eric Holder in office, it is unlikely that we would have gotten something called the Fair Sentencing Act that reduced disparities between crack and powder cocaine, took off three years of drug sentences for many who used the effort with, with, with drugs. If it were not for Eric Holder, we wouldn't have an attorney general arguing that people who were convicted of felonies should be entitled to vote. If it were not for Eric Holder, we would not have a comprehensive effort to reduce sentencing disparities based on uh, mandatory minimums that have been generated. So elections matter, guys. When Eric Holder is challenged by the House of Representatives and thrown into a censorship fight, he's being censured, rather, that's, that's something we should be concerned about. And when people talk about the potential to impeach President Obama because he has carried out policies that are in the best interest of the country, understand that is an attack on his record and the programs that he is pursuing. So when we don't have a jobs program that responds to the high level of unemployment in the African American community, because obstruction of the jobs program was seen as being in the interest of his political opponents, that's a consequence we have to deal with. When we are challenged about providing resources, I mentioned Medicaid earlier, there are school uh, uh, costs for public education that are affected by elections. So there are a number of both major and micro issues, guys, that are affected by the outcome of elections. So I'm looking to use what we have. You know, Ferguson has given us a moment that will help generate a movement. And yes, I'm delighted that groups like Color of Change and others are in the effort. But I'm now looking for a hashtag that says, hands up, go vote. 
Because yeah. there is That's what we thought also. Hands up, go vote. We can do that. You know, there is a connection between what you do and the consequences that we are feeling on the ground. So when the president supports providing body cameras for police officers as a way of helping to protect all of us by giving us film of what happened, that's a positive. Or when Holder, who has responsibility for writing guidance from the Department of Justice that determines how race can be used in law right. enforcement purposes, that is something that only he is capable of organizing and doing. And so I'm saying, yes, we do have to educate ourselves, but look, I want to go back to something that Congresswoman Beatty said. You know, there is a judge in this country, Damon Keith. He's now a 92-year-old retired judge out of, uh, out of uh, Michigan. He is an incredible guy. He told me once, look, Wade, you know, you walk across floors you never scrubbed. You walk through doors you never opened. You have an obligation to do that for those who come behind you. That's why at 92, he's raising hell and encouraging people to do what is necessary. So yes, you did walk across floors you never scrubbed. And yes, you do walk through doors you never opened. And the key is using the power that we already have in our hands to determine the outcome of change we want to see. Thank you so much, Elaine. What was your question to me, Jerry? My question was, how do we play? Please, a round of applause is all right. Oh, oh yes. Hey. How do we begin to play a more sophisticated financial game in electoral politics? You know, I just go back to the principle, all politics is local. Right. It's local. It's not national. Because coming from our organization at our community level, we can go national. That's easy enough to do. And we're already organized to do that. But we used to have, and we have to get back to it, in our communities, they used to be called voting crusades and or the crusade for voters or the voter leagues. Or, and what this committee did was one for something like your, your home. What they would do is, in terms of the police department, who hires these people? Who is the official what? or the officials that hire the police? Yes. Department of Public Safety, you know, you look, what role does the governor play? What role does the mayor play? What role, who are the public policy people that get, bring them on the force? Put that, so when the local election comes, we can have a direct connection between the person who's running and the composition of the police department and what their power is. In other words, it's an ongoing education process about what goes on at home. <coughs> you get your voter leagues and your crusade, you keep informed locally. And then you come together and you can even collect your money locally. Well, we like what so-and-so is saying and what so-and-so is saying about this, so we're going to give this $500 to that campaign. We're going to just, I mean, you can, and, and it, it's, it's, it's where your power lies. And so, so that's how you do it. And it also builds awareness. It, it builds awareness. We are not... We are not, we, we are engaged spasmodically, episodically. Every once, we get that. But it is, who someone, one of my colleagues said, it's 365 days a year being engaged. Yes. Knowing the power. We don't know our power. Knowing the power of the vote. When somebody tells you they're registered and you doubt it, get with them. Or go with them. Let's go check your registration to make sure the address is right. It's all in the details. So when they show up, they don't have a problem when it's time to vote. That's your power. And it, it starts, look, you need the, your organization locally. You need your research group. You need your folk who think about the money. You need your community meetings. Yes. You know, you don't have to have them every week. But you know, once a month, there ought to be a community meeting about what's going on here at home. And, and, and you build, it's, 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 that's how you, it's organization and it's structure. Thank you so much. 
I want to make sure we get to as many questions as we can. Um, and so there are three rules. Those of you that have been with me when I've moderated before know those rules. <laughs> the first rule is ask a question. Please. The second rule, <laughs> ask a question. The third rule is we, we have confirmation on this. Uh, we, we have a, a, a breaking announcement that um, Congresswoman Pelosi needs to make that is uh, important. Here, here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do. Uh, I. I, I th this has been spectacular, and I want to thank Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, a freshman member of Congress, for her leadership yeah. uh, in putting all of this together. <laughs> and Sanford Bishop, uh, a senior member yeah. of Congress, a champion for veterans, for putting this together. Thank you, Sanford, again. And I also want to acknowledge that while we're here this week, the president has been at the UN, and I was proud to appoint, and the president made the official appointment of Barbara Lee to be a House Democrats representative at the United Nations General <laughs> Assembly. I, I, I find this to be so fabulous, and aren't they all wonderful? And I do associate myself with the comments that Wade made about the excellence of our great Attorney General, Eric Holder. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I do want to, though, say that the C Congressional Black Caucus was instrumental in almost every one of the initiatives, whether right. it was crack cocaine disparity. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, our Chairwoman, Marsha Fudge, knows that the leadership of that caucus made so much of what you've Absolutely. talked about here possible. So I, I didn't want that to go amiss. And when it, you talk about Medicaid and the rest, Charlie Rangel and members of the Congressional Black Caucus insisted that be strong part of the Affordable Care Act. Absolutely. So I want to salute the Congressional Black Caucus in that. And then just to say, and Donald, we talked about your dad earlier, Donald Payne, who's uh, joined us since, and Donna Edwards, who's joined us since uh, earlier. But uh, the word is now that the Attorney General will resign. Uh, today and that he has oh, served wow. our country what? So very very well. Wow. But the message is oh, that the Attorney General wow. will be uh, submitting his resignation to wow. the President. So let us salute him <coughs> once again oh, for all of his wow. great, great Why? That is so bad. That is terrible. That's wow. devastating. Why? That's devastating. Wow. That's devastating. That is so sad. Thank you so much, Leader Pelosi. Wow. Wow. And that is a yeah, shock. A yeah, that's um, a bad you know that was? I did not. So it's almost like we need to have another panel <laughs> uh, uh, about <laughs> Attorney General Holder. But I, I do want to make sure we honor those in line. So uh, I said the first two rules, which were ask a question. The is, third rule is, is ask a question. Um, you have 30 seconds to ask that question. Uh, to set that question the, up, at which time I will you ask you to room ask room? a question. If you can direct it to one member of the panel, that would be helpful. If not, we'll direct one member of the panel to answer it so we can get to as many questions as possible. Yes, sir. If we can do one thing, if you can allow her to hold the mic, because it's statistically proven that you talk 30% longer when the mic is in your hand. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, prior to the March on Washington, there was a coalition of civil rights and social justice organizations, the NAACP, the Urban League, uh, Rainbow Bush, uh, Rainbow Bush. How do we inculcate in our young people's minds the value that voting is not just a right, it is a responsibility. It is a responsibility to ourselves, a responsibility to uh, the ones who we love and live in community with, it is responsibility to the world. Thank you so much. How do we organize? I got, I got your question. Yes, sir. To so, how do we organize coalitions, um, some of which already exist? And so, uh, Barbara, if you wouldn't mind talking about some of those coalitions that already exist. But I think the crux of his question was about how do we get young people indoctrinated in that? Um, and you also know some of the young people that are doing that as well. Exactly. And the reality is, is that. The coalition around Ferguson that we put together, I did that from my sick bed. I was at home with a back infection when, uh, when it was just, you know, God moving in his own way. I was due to be out of the country with Wade and some others uh, to argue before the UN about, you know, our voting rights and other rights, uh, criminal justice issues. 
Uh, and when I saw what happened to Mike Brown, and I start seeing Twitter blowing up, and I start getting calls, I knew we couldn't just do nothing. And as a result, I called Tanya Clay House, who is here in the audience, our brilliant public policy director, who was able to help me convene as many civil rights organizations as we could get on the phone. Uh, and we talked, uh, you know, we had all their experts, and that's how we came up with the state, the unified statement. We decided not to just go do our own organizational thing, but that we needed a coalition. If you're talking about movement, you can't do it with just one organization. Movement requires everybody. That's why I'm here seeking and soliciting your individual and organizational signature on that statement, because coalition building. What I love about what Darnell, Charlene, Phil, and all of the young people involved in Hands Up, Don't Shoot, the Ferguson battle, the police reform battle, is that they also are co uh, coalescing. And I love the way that they've been able to figure it out, that you know, this group will take the lead on having a march on this weekend, this Saturday, the next group will do it, the next one, and that they come and support each other. That's what we have to do. So coalition is absolutely in our bones, but we gotta make it happen. Egos are a problem. Organizational credit is a problem. You know, there are so many problems you have to overcome when you deal with coalitions. But I will tell you that they can be overcome, that I fight with it every day, and I push people for it, and we get it done. We had a meeting with the White House, a meeting with the Department of uh, Homeland Security. We've done all of this work through coalition. So, Jeff, I want to tell you that we get it, that the young people get it, and the final word I just want to say is that there's never been a successful movement in America, never been a successful movement of African Americans that wasn't intergenerational. Hmm. That it takes the elders, the young, and the in-between. Thank you so much. Thank Sir, you. Sir, re really quickly, I want to make sure to, to your question, there are young people who just want to be listened to. Yes. A lot of times we're trying to get them to do something in a, in a, with a methodology that they're not interested in. And so you show me a city, I'll show you young people that care. A lot of times we're so busy trying to tell them how to do it. Yeah. They already know how they want to do it. We just need to listen. Yes. Then secondly, we need to support them as advisors, not as directors. Um, they've already got coalitions of their own. Right. And so sometimes it's just about creating the bridge uh, many of you know that in the last 48 hours that T.D. Jakes sued Kendrick Lamar. Um, Kendrick Lamar used a line of T.D. Jakes' message in his song, and T.D. Jakes' folks are suing him. I felt like it was a real opportunity for Jakes to say, all right, brother, let me talk to you about this copyright infringement, but let's have a conversation. Because Kendrick using that line was a honor it was, it was a positive song, it was a positive message. They heard something in Jake's voice that they admired and they used it. And so there was an opportunity to build a bridge even though Jake's may not have liked the language or the approach. Too often we got old people that don't want to build the bridge and elders that we can't find to help build it. Thank you so much, yes ma'am. Hi, my name is Brittany Clay Brooks. I was also a dream defender at Florida A&M University where we stayed in the Capitol for 31 days and 30 nights um, trying to get a special hearing for Stay in Your Ground. But one of the things that I noticed, um, and this could either go to Miss Elaine or Miss Barbara because you guys have been touching on it, um, what are some things that we can do as young people to um, continue the attention from prominent or national figures, because we are still going to hearings, we are still being briefed on policy issues, we are still registering people to vote, but what happens is that because the cameras are no longer around or CNN is not no longer on our track, how do we continue to engage and garner that support from those prominent figures who showed up, the NAACP, who showed up for us when, you know, all the cameras were around us. So, and so restate the question stuff. for me. How, is, how do we as young people continue to garner that support from you all so it's no longer just a young people's movement at that time and that's so cute versus that long-term <laughs> movement Thank you. material yes. that we need? Thank you so much. 
I'm, okay. Congressman. Congressman. Let, let me just give you one, just one example. Most people didn't hear about Selma until 1965. But members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee went to Selma in 1962. That's right. And started building and, and build a movement. Mm -hmm. And so when Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. came to Selma in January 1965, it brought more press attention. But the young people, the students, the look, we created a coalition. The March on Washington was a coalition. It was A. Philip Randolph, but young John Lewis, 23 years old, was there in the meeting at the table. So when people tell you to be quiet, speak up, speak up. And, and find so a way to, to get in the way and make some noise. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. <clears throat> I, I can't do that right now. I got to get to the next question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. My name is Denise Jenkins. I'm with Stand Up for Democracy and DC Coalition, otherwise known as Free DC. I'm representing the 650,000 people who live in the nation's capital and have no say so over these life and death issues. We have no representation, no vote in the House, no vote in the Senate. Although we pay the highest federal taxes in the country, we do everything that a citizen needs to do. So your question, I want to thank the Black Caucus because they are leading in co-sponsoring our legislation. They are leading. I want to thank Wade Henderson. Now, because he testified at our first hearing in the Senate in 20 I, I, I years. I appreciate your appreciations, okay. but I need you to ask now, a question for me, please. My question is, how can the Black Caucus reach out to the other members of the House and the Senate to get them on board with our legislation become the 51st state? Thank you so much. Jeff. Wait, and then the Congress. No, it, it's a great question, uh, Ms. Jenkins. Thanks for asking it. I would only say this. Look, D.C. deserves the vote. You know, we struggle to bring democracy to Baghdad. We bring it to Afghanistan. And we deny it right here at home on the Potomac. And it's really outrageous when you think about that. But it is going to be up to D.C. residents itself, ourselves, to raise our voices to make this a national issue. The Black Caucus has been incredible. They've signed up their own members. They've advanced this agenda. But if we're going to make progress in getting other members of Congress, uh, you know, support this bill, we're going to have to, as Congressman Lewis said, make some noise, get in the way, make this an issue that people are forced to address because it is democracy, plain and simple. And I think we can do that. We have the power here in D.C. to make it happen. We also strengthen the Black Caucus. That's right. When we vote for all of those people That's that right. they have to deal with That's right. across the, the Congress. I mean, if they know they've got a group of black a folk lane, out there who are voting, lane. I'm telling you, they'll listen. When March and First got something to say, they gonna listen. Uh, uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I wanna leave that answer right there, Congresswoman. I'm gonna come back to you on the, on the, on the next one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, Jack. My name is Arnold King, and I'm the uh, Benny consultant from Prince George County, Maryland. My question is, uh, what can we do to get more African Americans to get involved in city, in city issue more? In other words, what can we do to uh, get to get get uh, people in the neighborhood get involved in city issue? Because when I went to, uh, I, I appreciate the question. I'm going to make sure that we get them to answer that, that. It's really about how do we do this grassroots piece exactly. and get people engaged at the local level in not just city politics, but I'm sure across the board. Um, Anyone that wants to take that. I, Gotta speak to the people. Elaine, go ahead. I just think people are moved by stories, by what our folk have done. I mean, with Vernon Dahmer, 1966, right. looked white, didn't have to be black. Looked white, owned a sawmill, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, told, went on the radio and told black people, I will pay your poll tax. You just come out and vote. The next night, the Klan came, they firebombed his house. Right. He got his eight kids out the back door and his wife. And he died three days later of smoke inhalation. And on his tombstone right now in Hattiesburg, if you don't vote, 
you don't count. That's right. He's one of many who gave their lives. We need to go through them. Have our young folk come in and see our martyrs, modern day martyrs. I'm not talking about 1870. I'm talking about the 1970s and, and, and 1960s and up until the present. Michael, Michael Brown is laying in his grave now because we didn't get out there to the poll right. and do what we have to do. People don't have Medicaid because we didn't Tell show up in 2010 right. to vote. So it's all connected. Tell the story. Thank you so much. And thank you for your question, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Eduardo Gitti. I come from Central America, Honduras, and I wanted to just basically make a statement to you. Thank you all very much for all of this. I, we, I am honored to be here amongst all of these phenomenal legacy owners of the African-American struggle. In Central America, we actually imitate you, and we imitate what African-Americans have done throughout, actually every African, and I'll be brief, every African American, uh, every African descendant around the world actually looks to you and your parents. You are our North. And so when it was said that we don't really know the power that we have in our hands yes. through the vote, it's a, such a true statement. And I commit, I commit that my sphere of influence will be influenced to get out and vote, here, here. get out and, and not only register, but to actually get involved in every one of those local areas because another point with that- No, I, got, I, 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 gave you, I gave you room, brother. I gave you room. <laughs> I, you said Honduras. I'm like, I gotta give him a minute with the comment, but you can't have two. Um, but the point was a great one, you all, and, and, I, and I think that I, I appreciate that because it does say how many people are watching us. And with all of the resources we have at our disposal, we have an unbelievable opportunity to be an example to those who often have less than we do uh, to show what can happen. So thank you very much for that comment, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, <clears throat> Congressman Lewis, um, my name is General Parker. I'm from Peoria, Illinois. Um, I'm a well-known activist back there, and I advocate strongly for uh, education. Three years ago, I ran for a school board and my election would have made a black majority on the board. Yeah. Two days before the election, state's attorney had my name removed from the ballot, and I found out that was done illegally. Um, I found out that my voting rights were violated, and the people who chose to vote for me and signed all those petitions to keep me on the ballot. So I need you to ask your question, right. brother. It's coming right now. I, thank you. Um, I found out that you were going to speak at the King Day celebration in January. And I know 50 years ago- I, I need your you question, would've... brother, please. 50 years ago- Just honor the marched... people that are behind you, brother, as I'm honoring you. 50 years you. ago, you would've marched with me to fight against stuff like that. So what do I go back and tell my people who support me that you are condoning what the very people who violated my rights are doing to them? I don't quite understand I don't know. Oh, the question. Hi, you, am I condoning? You were, you were chosen to speak at the King Day celebration this January. In next, January. next year. Uh, I'm not so sure that I will be speaking uh, in Peoria or any other place in January. I get a lot of invitations from all around America, but uh, I'm not sure that I will be speaking there. Appreciate that. Thank you. But you should uh, go out and run again. Don't give up. Nice. Don't give in. Don't become bitter. Don't become right. hostile. Right. Go out there and continue to fight. Stand up. That's right. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Ariane Abney from the Poise Foundation, which is an African-American owned and operated community foundation in the Pittsburgh area. My question is around the Military and Overseas Voter Empowerment Act of 2009, yes. Yes. which allows uniformed military officers to now vote online. And so when we talk about trying to get young people engaged in the voter process, we got to speak their language. And their language is online, it's yes. social media, stuff like that. So do you see us moving forward into the future if this pilot program is successful to moving towards an online voter uh, system? Thank you. Yes. It's a great question, brother. It is a great question. And yes, the new military act that you refer to is an important contribution to democracy. But we also have to make sure 
that we safeguard and protect the integrity of the vote. Right. That's and we have to make sure that the machinery that we use is not used to subvert the very vote that we are trying to lift up. Right. So I got you. There are places like Oregon that are experimenting, and it's a positive thing. But I'm going to say this, brother. Like, I'm on Twitter. You know, I'm Wade for justice, okay? <laughs> bottom line, I'm just telling you. And, and the bottom line is we're going to have to use those social media tools. But we also have to engage where people are. There are people who are not plugged in, and they need to cast a paper ballot. That's right. There are some who are, and they can have alternatives. But our job is to organize that community in the broadest sense and link issues of importance to what they do. You know, you talked about economics, Jeff, and this is my last point. Payday lending is a scourge, a scourge in our communities. Scourge. There are potential regulations that are going to be issued soon, determined by the Obama administration and in part created by a group called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that the caucus struggled to make happen. That's why we're getting this progress. So I'm saying don't disconnect what is happening on the ground with the importance of the vote that you cast. And that is how I think we use it. We use that anger to motivate people to come out and to make a difference in their own lives. And Wade, right. we yes, should good. point out to people yeah. that one of the best voting reforms that's been happening in the country is online voter registration. Right. That's if right. your state doesn't have it, you've got to push for it. Yeah. Because it has been radical <laughs> in getting people to yeah. sign up yeah. and to register to vote, especially young people. So that's where we're seeing you know, the promise of online you know, uh, online, you know, technology in voting. And don't forget that when Sandy happened, all of a sudden New Jersey figured out a way to do online voting. So we need to understand that there is potential, but we got to make sure that the technology is available to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and immediately uh, following this panel, for those of you from uh, Maryland, Virginia, and D.C., there is voter registration. Uh, right outside All the right. door. That's right. Uh, All right now. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Garrick Morgan, and uh, my question is, um, how can we really not only take this, mo uh, take this uh, time to change this movement, I mean, take this opportunity to turn this movement into a moment, Yes. but what can we honestly do? Why are we afraid to speak to the real issue, which I feel is racism, white supremacy, this beautiful sister right here said something to the effect of, what would we do if we really realized that uh, we could boycott? I mean, we have no So, so restate your question for me. I guess we, uh, we, tip that, we tiptoe and dance around the real issue, the root of the issue, which I feel is racism, white supremacy, which handcuffs us all. Okay, so let me do this, because we all know that within a week of being in office, Eric Holder said that we as a nation, we, we were a nation of cowards yes. as it relates to the issue of race. Yes. Um, and so uh, any of you who'd like to take that on, but, but I'd love for, for Congressman Lewis to, to lead that off. Well, let, let me just say this, young brother. I don't think any of us, not one of us, going to deny that the scars of racism is still deeply embedded in every corner of the American society. We're not gonna run from that. And we're gonna deal with it. But we cannot deal with it alone. You got to use the vote. You got to organize and mobilize. You just cannot talk about it. You got to do something about it. That's what another generation did. Let me just, let me just add to that. Because Co Congresswoman, as you answer that, though, because I, I want to push back a little bit, because I think that especially as we're dealing with younger and younger generations, yes. there's this notion, we kept having to fight this notion of post-racial America. Yes. Yes. We kept having to fight that, that narrative being pushed out well, into public space. We're not there yet. We're not there no, yet. I agree, but the problem is you have a younger generation that is so happy with where we are, doesn't have the historical context of where we've been, and to his point are even told, I, I have a son who until I, I started having to indoctrinate a little bit harder, anytime we brought up stuff about black people, he got nervous <laughs> because he's in a school where everybody is tiptoeing through the tulips and holding hands and singing kumbaya, riding unicorns under a rainbow. 
Uh, but but we know that that he, as a young kid in a school that's dealing with that racism, needs to be able to see it for it is what it is without it weighing him down. How do we begin to do that so that when we have rough conversations, we don't run from the racism conversation at the same time that we don't blame everything for it? Yes. Yes. Let and me just say question. that this town hall meeting and the 70 some workshops are because of your question. So the Congressional Black Caucus is very sensitive to that because diversity has created a new problem for us with the younger folks who don't understand the history of what a Mr. Lewis or Elaine or others went through. So let me say to the young people, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge is having a town hall forum tomorrow morning and she's bringing the dream defenders with Phillips Agnew, so young folks can be engaged yeah. in that. We have 70 some workshops, and we have African American members, black folks in the Congressional Black Caucus who have planned this because they want you to understand the behind the scenes. This just didn't happen. Getting the contracts, making sure that we have black folks who are engaged, the hotel that we're in, because we understand racism exists. So we move members to be where they're black contractors. We have insisted on things because we know racism prevails. And I also think it's our other counterparts who wanted to put that post ratio out there so we too would get comfortable. So to the young folks in the audience, don't think that you don't have members of Congress that belong to our tri caucuses who aren't fighting for yeah. us. Every day that Congresswoman Marsha Fudge walks in that House of Representatives, I assure you there is an issue or someone she's taken to task and is usually for the least of us. There is a reason they call us the conscience of the Congress. Yes. It's because we're black yes. and we know racism still avails. Yeah. Thank you and thank you for your question. Let me do this. Um, because we are nearing the end. I cannot get everyone in the line, um, but what I'd like to do is get the last three of you to one right after the other, concisely state your question, um, and we will get the panelists to answer that before we go to closing remarks. So the next three, I'm, and if, if others of you have questions, tweet them, um, and if we're able to get to them, we will, but those last three, if you would concisely state your question. Hi, my name is Leela Winston, and I work with CVM National, which is a nonprofit. Um, but I'm also a volunteer um, local uh, government um, committee person. And I would like to know how we can engage individuals to be part of local government and other areas where your leaders actually do come from. Yes. How can we actually engage people who are the most affected, who may not have Great. access to technology? Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. My name is Siante Prescott. I'm a student from Cleveland, Ohio, and I wanted to know what we could do to possibly gain a respect, the proper respect for my country. That's all. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> right. That's good. My name is Gladdell Reese. I'm a Washington, D.C. native. I, you talked on the panel about the militarization of the police force. Yes. I wanted to know why in June did the Congressional Black Caucus vote 80 percent against the grace on the grace on the mean amendment that was prevented the pentagon from transferring military arms and equipment to local and state police all right thank you so we have those three questions we have we have the congressional black caucus support of a bill that helped militarize police we have a question on uh, the simple task of how do we get the country to respect black people and then we have uh, the first question <laughs> <laughs> on, I, I, I think it's a great it's question. It's a great question. I, I, I think, but there are college level courses and ministries right. that are engaged yes. in that on an everyday basis. But, but, the, but the last was, how do we get people on the ground who are most affected? I think similar to the, the, the candidate incubator process. How do we get people most affected by what happens by local policy to be involved in the, in the local uh, electoral process? Uh, anyone that wants to take the, the uh, clearly a member of the Congressional Black Caucus can address the, the question about the militarization of police and the bill that you all supposedly supported 80%. I, I came 80%. Up here just for that reason. I figured so. Okay. You want me to do that first? Yes. Yeah. I would not looking like that. I don't want to go to anything else. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I've heard so much of this foolishness on Twitter about the Black Caucus voted against the Grayson Amendment because it was a dumb amendment. That's the first thing. 
Anytime you say that you cannot give any police department any equipment goes to the extreme. I represent the city of Cleveland, one of the poorest cities in the country. You think I'm gonna say that my police department shouldn't get bulletproof vests or helmets or guns or radios, but the Grayson Amendment would not have allowed that to happen. Everything is not Ferguson. So why would you vote for something that is so extreme that you hurt yourself? It just doesn't make any sense. And so yes, we voted against it, and yes, I am glad that we did because it was the right thing to do. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. How do we get, uh, Congressman Becerra, how do we get local folks, um, those folks that are most affected by local policy to be engaged in the local process? Um, and, and, and in a robust way, not just a superficial um, event kind of way. We got an institution that every day gives us an opportunity to do that and that's our public schools. Because every day our kids are gonna be indoctrinated and what we can do is make sure that they're coming out ready to run for that senior class president, that treasurer, to be part of that city school, uh, that city, uh, excuse me, the school council for, those, for that particular school to get the training. We gotta teach our kids, every time there's an election coming, they gotta be excited as if it were Christmas. And they say, mommy, you daddy, you taking me to the polls because it's time to go, go vote. We gotta tell that church that always takes people to the, the, the polls on election day, you need a new bus? We're gonna raise the money to buy you a, no, a new bus or another bus because that's what we want is to find that there are institutions that want us to do this. And if we give the incentives to our young folks to be the leaders, as was said earlier, not just to follow, but to actually lead with our guidance, then they become the leaders of the future real quick. Mm. I'm excited about this one, and, and, and all of you have the chance to address some of these in your closing remarks, but I'm excited, Elaine, about you answering the question, how do we get America to respect black people? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. It's a great question because, you know, you don't really have to like me. <laughs> you don't really have to like me. You know, but as long as I know that I live in this constitutional democracy and I have a vote and I have a people and we have common interests and we're working together and we will be counted in this process, you're going to respect me. Now you don't have to respect me as much because you can diss me the way you do in Ferguson and different places, you know, and you can devalue the life of my black sons and brothers. You know, you, and, 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 and you do it, you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, 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 it's pretty, it's a part of almost routine. Mm -hmm. You know, but what would get us the respect and the engagement is our local folk who are disengaged and don't have all, all that education that we have out here and all those degrees, but who are affected every day. You start talking about criminal justice because they're all affected by that Absolutely. system. You start talking about criminal justice at home and what we can do as a community to change this system, they, you will go to an issue that speaks to them. And I bet you if we really work on it and they will come out and tell us what their issues are and how they think we can help. But we have to show some solidarity and some community with, with our own. And uh, we'll get the respect Thank when you we so give much. it to each other. Congresswoman, what we'd like to do before we go to closing remarks is, is recognize the other members of the Congressional Black Caucus who are here with us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Donald Payne Jr. from New Jersey. All right. Robin Kelly, keep standing up, Donald. Robin Kelly from Illinois. <laughs> of course, you've met our co-chair, Joyce Beatty from Columbus, Ohio. Yes. Barbara Lee from California. Yes! Donna Edwards from Maryland. All right, yeah! Uh, do I see, are there any other members here? All right, thank you. Oh, of course, uh, and, and again, I just want to thank our leader for being here, Nancy Pelosi. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And, and before you all do that, point of personal privilege, there, there are two others 
in the room that need to be acknowledged for their unbelievable service. Uh, and those are my children uh, <laughs> who are out of school today and are angry with me for pointing all this attention to them. But Miles and Madison, I love you both so much. All right, yeah. Everything I do yeah. is for y'all. Yes. Amen. So y'all stand up just for a minute and just <laughs> allow everybody to see what I'm so proud of on a daily basis. Uh -huh. My 15-year-old is taller than me, and it's a problem. <laughs> I, I might have to become a member of the NRA. Um, just, just for the rights, not for the politics. Um, <laughs> let's do this. Clean it up, clean it up. I need you all to be able to give closing remarks in two minutes. Um, I will be respectfully, ridiculously interruptive after the two minutes. Um, and so if we could start with Wade and, oh. and end with the Congresswoman. Wow. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Thanks to the audience. A great and important program. Uh, let me say, guys, again, this is all about the vote and our power. And, and I think we've underscored that. But I just want to talk to the brother who raised this issue about bias as my closing remark. You know, we have a study out from the Department of Education. Four-year-old kids, black kids are 16%, 18% of the preschool enrollment, yet they are 46% of those who are expelled from preschool. Now, I'm telling you guys, bias is out there, it's real. But if you're gonna deal with it, you're gonna need a multiracial coalition. You're gonna need a coalition because only in coalition is their strength. And beyond what we can produce ourselves, we have it, but we gotta be in coalition. And we also have to recognize that every issue has an interest that we serve. The brother here from Honduras. Immigration is a black American issue, just as it is an issue for other communities, and we need to be a part of these debates. So I would say we have the power, hands up, go vote, and I'm looking to see us make a difference in November, because if we don't, then this effort would have been for naught and an interesting conversation, but if we don't turn it into a real show of power and force, then we're not anywhere. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much. Lane. We have had the right to vote for 144 years, since 1870. Women have had it for 94 years, since 1920. Voter suppression is nothing new. Oh, Nothing new. Throughout that entire, we've had the right to vote on paper for that amount of time. Mm -hmm. There have been three quick periods, three periods that you have had severe voting repression. Yeah. One started in the 1890s after the brothers elected those 24 blacks. They started lynching them and changing the poll tax, literacy test, state constitution. That was the first period. And they drove us all out of Congress in 1901. Next black from the South got back with uh, Mel White back in 1972. All right. Next, 1992. Next, the second period was the Voting Rights Act, 1965. All the folks dying through the 50s and 60s trying to give us a Voting Rights Act to enforce our constitutional right. The third voter suppression period is when? Now. 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 Right now. now. Right now. We're in it. So others know our power. We have to know it, we have to protect it, and despite what they do, we got to find a way to get to these polls and make our vote count. That's all. Thank you so much. All right. <clears throat> Congressman Lewis. Jeff, thank you very much for moderating this group. I don't want to say that much about the vote. I think I said all that I need to say, and I won't take the two minutes. But I think it's important for us, and especially young people, to understand our history, to understand the distance we've come, the progress we've made as a people and as a nation. We're not there yet. We have not yet created the beloved community. But in the, in the process of moving, we must learn to be kind to each other and respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. Yes. On, in this country, on this little piece of real estate, we got to learn to live together. 
as brothers and sisters. We do. It doesn't matter whether we are black or white, Latino, Asian American or Native American. We're not going any place. We're going to be here. The country is changing. And if so many of our brothers and sisters are living in fear. They feel the unknown, but you must not be afraid and understand that our struggle is not a struggle that lasts for one day, one week, That's or right. one month, or one year, or one lifetime. That's right. But you must do what you must do and pay your dues like our forefather and ancestor played. Hey. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Congressman. Hey. Hey. Bye. Resources. I want to just give a few resources for people to use in helping people to become voting rights mm -hmm. champions all over this country. I mentioned the toolkits that's on our website at lawyerscommittee.org. We also just put out a mobile app for your smartphones where you can call anybody in the country and say, are you registered to vote? And if they say, I don't know, think so, whatever, I don't think so, whatever, you can actually look it up for them and tell them if they're registered. You can tell them where to go register, what the rules are in, the in their state, and you can also use the app to tell them how to register online, to use the you know, National Voter Registration Form. It has all that information. Get that app right now by texting 90975. That's 90975. Once again, if you go to the lawyerscommittee.org, you'll find that information. The other resource we have for you right now is you can call our hotline. We have lawyer, legal volunteers available to answer your questions. If you don't know if it's, if it's possible for somebody who is an ex-felon to vote in your state, if you don't know, you know what uh, the rules are about voting in your state and you're curious about voter ID, if it applies, etc., call 1-866-OUR-VOTE. 1-866-O-U-R-V-O-T-E. 1-866-687-8683. We got people to give you the information because ultimately, as somebody said, it's about resources. And these are resources that help you to be a great voting rights champion. I hope that you'll sign the statement. I hope that you'll be there. I am thrilled at this moment. I'm not, a, I'm not negative at all. Because but you are change, out of time. Because change is coming. <laughs> change is coming, Jeff. And as Marcus Garvey said, look for me in the whirlwind. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so <laughs> All much. All right. Uh, and, and, and just to repeat that for the app, it's text EPAPP -P -P to 90975. That's text EPAPP -P -P app. Yes, we got that. I just want to make sure for those that can't spell. Yes, okay. Um, to 90975. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Congressman Becerra. Jeff, let me begin by first thanking Chairwoman Fudge and all the members of the Black Caucus for inviting me to be here as well. We've heard the word them for a long time. Well. That's always trouble. When they use the word them, we know what comes. But has it ever been different? Have you ever heard a different word? And today we had a great conversation about all the things we need to do. But you know what? They're still using the word them out there. About a month ago, a lot of us believed in the Latino community that something great was going to happen because the president was going to do something Congress would not because Republicans kept blocking of a reform of a broken immigration system. But it didn't come. There is deep disappointment. And as Wade said, this is not an issue just for the Latino community. Deep disappointment. But there's now a movement to tell people you should not go vote because people did not come through the way you, did, you wanted them to. Let me tell you, that is a dangerous thing. Every month for the next 20 years, 50,000 Latinos a month will turn 18. If we're smart, we see the power that is right there in our hands. And so some of us are beginning to do something a little different in Congress. We no longer talk so much about the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. We talk about the Tri-Caucus. 
and how we are working together. And so my message is we can't be on the defensive. We can't just react when Ferguson comes along. It has to be the offensive. Nancy Pelosi, who has stayed throughout this entire session, and there's not often you get a leader who sticks around for two hours, can tell you best, can tell you best that we can have all the willpower we want, but if you don't put skin in the game, if you don't put money on the table, it's gonna take a lot longer. And so if my final message is this, we need to own voter registration. We need to own voter registration. No one else will do it for us. We need to own voter registration. We gotta put money on the table for it, and then we decide how it gets done for us. Don't let them do it, let us do it. We need to own voter registration. Thank you. Congressman Fudge. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for coming, especially this panel and Jeff. Um, and I was listening to Elaine, and I had been thinking about it earlier. I was saying to myself that 50 years after the Civil Rights Act, we are still begging people to vote. Mm. I really do not understand it. Uh, but let me just say to you, there are two things I really do want you to think about. One is I hope you will spend this much time with your local elected officials. As you've, I guarantee you, most people in this room have not done that. Mm. With your school board, with your city council. And see, then you won't be calling me talking about somebody didn't pick up your trash. You need to call your city council person for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say it that way because I need you to understand we all have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And the Congressional Black Caucus cannot do it all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. Everybody right. has to do their part. Right. Um, we are a very resilient people. Mm -hmm. We have come through more than any race of people on this earth. And you mean to tell me we can't stand up and fight for ourselves? I don't know what to say mm, to you. Mm. But I will say these words to you. The Black Caucus fights for you every day, even when you won't fight for yourself. We fight for you. Mm. Whether it's immigration or education, whether it's food stamps, whether it's housing, we fight for you every day. Mm. So my message to you is to contain your complaining. <laughs> contain your complaining. You need to take, your, you know, we all talk about we Christians and all that. You need to take your eyes off of your circumstance well, and look to the future. Go ahead. Yeah. Because today is not where we're going. Today may be a bad day. Maybe they don't respect us today, but take your eyes off of your circumstance <laughs> and look to God if you're a Christian. We love it. And if you're not a Christian, just look to the future. Yeah. But stop complaining about today and make tomorrow better. All right. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If we could do this very quickly. Anybody in the audience who is under the age of 21, will you please stand? Don't go jump away. It's, it's all right. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> and stay standing. If you're under 20, and you all please stay standing. If you're under 25, please stand. All right. If you are 30 or under, please stand. <laughs> now, let's be very clear. It was said earlier that there's never been a movement without young people. That's right. And, and I have to give a caveat. There's never been a movement that has not been led by young people. That's right. And so it is essential That's right. that all of us in the room who are not standing up look at these young leaders because this is theirs. And if we fail to support them, if we fail to help them be trained, if we fail to lift up their issues, if we fail to listen to their voice, if we fail to elevate their voice, then it is, we will kill our own legacy. Yep. Yes. Because whether we agree with how these young people do it or not is not the issue. Right. It's that we support them even in the face of that disagreement when they are operating in the call that God has for them before any of us were here to lead our community to the next level. And so for all those standing, I salute you. I salute the work that you're doing. I salute the methodology that you're using. I, 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 I applaud your intellect and your willingness to do it different, even in the face of haters. Bless you all, and we are here for you. God bless you. Let's give this panel an unbelievable round of applause. Congresswoman Marcia Fudge, Congressman Becerra, Thank you for letting me be part of it. <laughs> Barbara. Barbara Arwine, Congressman Lewis, 
Matt, Elaine, can I get some of that energy? And Wade Henderson, thank you all so much and have a great conference. Let's work, keep working together. Gotta do it. Thank you.